Existentialism is a Humanism was a lecture given by Jean-Paul Sartre in response to critics of existentialism who regard the existential move as giving rise to a theory of pessimism or quietism, inactivity, even nihilism, the view that life has no meaning. Now, I have said some things in anticipation of existentialism, but today we really want to define what is meant by the existential. Perhaps no other term in the history of philosophy has been abused as much as existential. It became a very attractive idea, even in popular culture in early 20th century France. But in my opinion, existentialism is the natural next step after Kant demonstrates the impossibility of doing transcendental metaphysics. What Kant has shown us is that the attempt to understand that which lies beyond the realm of possible experience, i.e. that which does not present itself in a spatial temporal perception, leads to empty concepts, meaning they can neither be proven nor disproven. That does not mean that concepts like God and soul and freedom are meaningless. In fact, they are very meaningful to us. They are the basis for giving meaning to life for many of us. But what Kierkegaard, who is regarded as the father of the existential movement, argues is that when reason enters into the dialectical difficulty that Kant described, when it realizes that it can neither prove nor disprove the existence of God or soul or freedom. And you may as well include the meaning of life. Because whether or not human existence has a transcendental meaning, an overarching purpose, lies beyond what I can demonstrate. But when the conditions of my life render me desperate for something to make sense of my suffering, According to Kierkegaard, I am then poised to make a leap of faith. Okay? Now this is Kierkegaard. Kierkegaard urges us to become subjective. Because we can approach truth from two different perspectives, what he calls the objective and the subjective. As an objective inquirer, like a scientist, the most I can ever 
achieved, according to Kierkegaard, is an approximation of the way things are. Yeah. Now this deviates from Kant. But because science is inductive, because it relies upon the repetition of results that confirm my hypothesis, no matter how many times I reproduce the same result, I can never move from a set of particular experiences to the establishment of a universal principle. And that is what Kant taught us. The universality and necessity of our principles that govern nature are provided a priori by the understanding. So science or objectivity can give me an approximate understanding of the world. But within us is what Kierkegaard calls an infinite desire of inwardness. We have a need to find meaning and purpose to our <clears throat> lives, especially in times of crisis. And so in the midst of a crisis, we are vulnerable and poised to make a leap of faith. Now, for Kierkegaard, which is surprising to many people since he is regarded as the father of existentialism, the leap is toward Christianity. To become subjective is to shift the question from what is true or whether Christianity is true as a matter of historical fact to the question of what must I do to participate in the happiness, the joy promised by Christianity. Now Kierkegaard's point is not to proselytize us into Christians. The point is that when it comes to finding a meaning in life, objectivity will never suffice because an infinite desire for meaning can never be satisfied by an approximation, which is the best that science can do. And so, the question becomes, knowing who I am, what can I be passionate about with enough fervor to sustain me throughout the ravages of my life? So for Kierkegaard, the highest experience possible for a being that exists in time is not knowledge, but passion. And in order for me to be passionate about something, I must make a decision. When I say something like, a thing is identical to itself, or the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. These are not decisions. Reason is compelled to affirm those judgments. If I tell you that A is equal to B and B is equal to C, then you are not free either to affirm or deny that A is equal to C. That's not a free decision. You are compelled as a rational being 
to accept that conclusion. So the only genuine decision making, so far as Kierkegaard is concerned, is in the face of uncertainty. Only where certainty is not possible must I make an authentic decision. And when I do make a decision about what the meaning of life is, then I take on risk. And the risk is not that I might someday be proven wrong, because these things can neither be proven nor disproven. The risk is losing my faith. Okay? As an academic, I have the leisure to suspend judgment for as long as I want. Because what's the difference if I die without ever saying yes or no to some hypothesis? But when it comes to finding something to get me out of bed in the morning, something to keep me from killing myself, Every moment is urgent. And so unlike what Descartes says in Meditation 4, that in the attempt to find absolute certainty, I have the luxury of suspending the will until the reason sees something clearly and distinctly. When it comes to finding something to live for, I don't have that luxury because we have an urgency for meaning. As Viktor Frankl eloquently says in Man's Search for Meaning, which is his account of his experiences in the concentration camps of World War II, it is mistaken to say that human beings are unwilling to suffer. Rather, we are unwilling to suffer without meaning. But give me something to live for, and I can live with almost any how. Okay? So Kierkegaard is a Christian existentialist because the focus is not on whether you choose Christianity or Buddhism or Taoism or any other ism, whether it's a religion or not. The point is that when it comes to finding something to live for, it is the result of a free decision. We choose our own meaning. Now, if you go back to Plato, who is the best point of contrast. Anything that exists does exist as the offspring or reflection of the forms. And so if there is a beautiful painting or a beautiful person or a beautiful gesture, these particular beautiful things draw their beauty from the essence of absolute beauty or the form of beauty itself. And so whether or not there ever was any beautiful thing in the world, the essence of beauty is eternal. Now, if you would like a less esoteric example, I can tell you what the essence of a triangle is. It is 180 degrees in a three-sided closed figure. And it will eternally be so. Even if there are no triangles anywhere in the world, even if the world is demolished and there are no more physical shapes, the essence of the idea of the triangle is eternal. If you have a three-sided closed figure lying in a plane, 
it will contain 180 degrees. And when it comes to artifacts, things we make, we create them for certain purposes, what Aristotle called the final cause of things. So even if the entire world ran out of chalk and nobody made any more chalk, which isn't that far-fetched of a possibility, the way things are going. Everything is going digital. I can still think about the concept of what a piece of chalk is, right? It is essentially a device for writing on slate. I can tell you what the essence of a clock is. It is a thing for keeping time. Okay, But if I ask what is the essence of human existence, what is the feature that makes the human being distinct from any other kind of being, there simply is no answer available to us. Now either there is no answer, which would suggest that God does not exist and we are simply the, re the result of the natural unfolding of the universe. Or if God does exist, or some other kind of creative force, and we do exist for a specific purpose and there is a meaning of human life, it lies beyond what I can demonstrate. I am not in a position to know it. And so the <coughs> burden of being human is our freedom. We are so radically free that we ourselves choose our essence. in existing. So whereas Plato would say, look, anything which exists has a pre-existing essence in the form. The form comes first and that which participates in the form exists as a copy of that essence. Existentialism as it is articulated by Sartre, reverses the order of existence and essence. Plato would say that the essence of things precedes the particular existence of things that exemplify that essence. But for the existentialists, first we exist we find ourselves already underway in what Heidegger calls the throw of existence. I sort of wake up to myself already embedded in a situation belonging to a family, speaking a particular language, in a certain culture and somewhere along the way <coughs> especially when the why arises we begin to ask what it means what is all of this what is the point of living. And for the existentialist, we exist, and only in existing do we then, at some point, choose our own essence. put it in platonic terms, we are becoming.
all the way down. There is nothing that we participate in. There's no form of human existence. Human beings are not born with owner's manuals for living. There is no design. There's no blueprint, no ideal. And so, in the course of existing, we make a decision about what it's going to be. And according to Sartre, in fact, to make a decision authentically means to take action. It is not enough to say that I hope to do this or that, or that I, I believe the meaning of life is this or that. You are only what you do. And at the end of your life, your, your life means the sum of your actions. So the meaning of life is chosen in living it. And that places a tremendous burden on the shoulders of the individual, just as it is incredibly liberating. Because I don't, I don't need to judge myself by anybody else's standard. I am not enslaved to anyone else's conception of what a person ought to be. But when I take action, I implicitly make a statement about what I believe a human being ought to be. And I thereby am what I do. But then Sartre takes it further and says, not only do I choose myself or choose what it is that I myself am by taking action, but in choosing myself, I choose all. I become responsible to all of you. And the awareness of that responsibility is what he calls anguish. Now why? Why am I responsible to you? When I make decisions for my own life, it's because no single individual is any more of a human being than any other individual. It doesn't matter that certain historical figures make a bigger splash than the rest of us. There will only be a handful of great figures. There's only one Shakespeare, one Einstein, one Mozart, one Plato. But just because what they did shifted paradigms and opened up entirely new worldviews doesn't mean that they have established what it means to be a person any more than I do. So everything that I do contributes to making humanity. Imagine this. Imagine that we knew in the near future that suddenly a giant asteroid was on a collision course with the Earth. And given our current technology, we could store enough fuel 
on some spacecraft to transport one person and nothing else to the next inhabitable planet. Now imagine that that person is you, for whatever reason. And when you leave this planet, shortly thereafter, the rest of humanity is obliterated. There is no record of the history of humanity. No trace of our cultures, our art, our, art, our languages. And so you land on this new world. And let's say that it's populated by some kind of intelligence. Whatever you do speaks for humanity. The entire wealth of what humanity is is contained within you, your individuality. Now that's my story. But what Sartre is saying is that this really is the case. It doesn't matter that there are six billion of us. Everything you do makes the absolute. Because there is no absolute human form that precedes the existence of each one of us as individuals. In fashioning ourselves, we fashion the absolute. The absolute is contained in the particular. That's existentialism. It begins and ends with the recognition that we cannot escape our subjectivity. If there is some meaning of human existence, we are not in a position to know what it is. And so we must make a decision. And we may not even know what our decisions are until after we have taken action. So again, the awareness of my being responsible, not just to myself, but to all of you, because when I act, I speak for humanity. Have you ever felt embarrassed at the behavior of a person? Even a person you don't know? It's because that person is one of us. And the behavior doesn't jive with what we think a human being ought to be. But from the start, we are nothing. Nothing. And we are only what we make of ourselves. That's existentialism. But in choosing what it is we're going to be, we find ourselves without any assistance. Even if you knock on the door of your local church, or psychologist, or philosophy professor, or spiritual guide. You have already chosen whose door to knock on. And you're going to keep knocking until you find the answer that is suitable to who you are. The answer that you can live with. Literally. The answer that can sustain your life in the midst of crisis. And that is what Sartre calls abandonment. We are abandoned to discovering, to making ourselves. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that at, it doesn't mean at all that at one point there was a God and it has fled and left us to ourselves. 
Okay. We have been abandoned by the idea or are no longer capable of putting any credence in the idea that something else like a god or a person can come along to make it all right for us. We ourselves must choose. And the burden of making that choice is urgent. It may not seem so when things are going along smoothly, but even your happiness after a while becomes questionable. And that's what Nietzsche says. The greatest moment you can have is when your own happiness becomes disgusting to you. And you realize, all along I thought that happiness itself made my life worth living. But it doesn't. And in making this choice, in deciding what to do, which way to turn, we come to realize that as free as we are, I am limited to that which is within my will. And as Sartre puts it, the sum total of factors that make my actions feasible. I cannot just decide to flap my arms and fly. And realizing that I must choose a direction from those available to me is what he calls despair. I may despair of my possibilities. But ultimately, what's important for the existentialist is not the what, it's the how. Am I able to give myself to an interpretation of human existence with complete abandon? And maintain it until my life has to be torn from me. And although it is all on my shoulders individually, as soon as I discover my individuality and my own freedom, I become aware of the fact that you also are free. And your freedom confronts mine. And that, in a sense, we collectively forge humanity call that intersubjectivity. Okay? So, re read this article. And, um, I know it's quick. Okay? But, 
on Thursday, we're going to, maybe I can put it off till Tuesday. I can put it off till Tuesday. We'll have a quiz over the SART material. Okay? And we only have three classes. Okay? So, next time, we begin Heidegger. Okay? All right. Yeah, I still have to come back for a so Maybe I can try to make up early Friday. Oh, okay. Uh, which ones are you available for that? Um, 